Alright. Hi everyone, it's day 12 of the Sanford Edible Garden Trail and I'm here with someone really special today, a friend of mine for a couple of years now. She has got one of the most spectacular gardens in Sanford and a lot of people have visited here. Uh, it's Jenny Cato. Uh, she also did the design for my place, uh, which you'll see later later on in the week. Um, but So we're going to have a look around. Jenny, where would you like to start? Uh, I think we'll start with the design, Chrissy, of course. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> So um, we've, well, I've been gardening here for nine years now um, and the house is just out at Highvale. We've got a property, it's just under two acres. Uh, we're a north facing house and we'll be, we're on a ridge. So the front yard is nice and flat. Uh, the backyard is quite slopey. So it was not the right sort of aspect. It got too much shade to have a garden out the back, a vegetable garden out the back and plus of the slope. So. Here we have it out in the front, which works really well because I actually get a lot of passive time in the garden by walking to and from the letterbox and to and from the car down there. So what I've got is I've got these two sides. This side is my annual veggie bed. So that way I'm having all my annuals together to maximize my watering. And the other side is mostly perennials. And if we come down this way, So I've also used, because it gets very hot out here, and in summertime I grow climbing beans, um, zucchinis and chocos along there to provide shade to the house. I've also put another layer of trees and annuals to help provide shade into the house. And then in winter these die back and let the winter sun come in and actually um, help warm the house. So. That's this side and that's pretty much replicated on the other side as well. In this garden as well, I've got, again, trying to reduce the heat. So I've used trellises a lot and growing, like here we've got a tromboncino zucchino, zucchini. So growing beans and zucchinis and cucumbers and things on the trellises to provide that shade and microclimates. I'm also using trees. So I've got a pawpaw, I've got a Ibicchia spinach, which is a perennial spinach tree just there, a tamarillo here. And again, they're providing a little bit of shade, passive cooling uh, to the garden. Uh, and then I've got my garden beds. I've got a main path going through the center, which is, goes up to our orchard area. And then I've got raised beds. Our soil is very poor here. The rumor is that um, when they did the development, they scraped off the the yeah. surf the soil and took it out to the new airport. So okay. basically when we first arrived we had about two centimetres of soil and then it was decomposed granite. Yeah, okay. So and that, that's a, that's a uh, problem that a lot of people in Sanford talk yes, about. Yes, so yeah. it's a challenge for growing trees particularly, fruit yeah. trees. Um, so I, all my beds are raised. Uh, initially I bought in some soil from the um, landscaper but all the rest I've had to improve with manure and lots and lots of compost, wormway uh, and lots of green manures. So I've got my beds of different shapes to fit in with the garden and you can see I've got my wintry things coming up now. Uh, let's go this way. <coughs> this is interesting Jenny, what, what have we got here? This is our trombone chino zucchini. Yeah. So if we have a look here, this is a very, well normally a very vigorous vine it took a beating in summer, but it actually came back after all the rain. I thought it had died back. This is a really great zucchini to have because it's um, extremely prolific. You plant it around September, October, and it will fruit right through till August okay. in a good year. Yep. The zucchinis are nice and firm. They're nice green zucchinis, a little bit nutty. So they're great to have in salads, raw. They hold their shape in casseroles. But they get, they get to this size. So this is about a kilo, just over a kilo. So they can get this big. So you can imagine, <laughs> you want to be careful walking around, you don't hit your head. Um, and when they get to this side, they get a nice tough skin. So it's a little bit like a pumpkin. So you can actually store it like a pumpkin. And all the seeds are up this end. Uh, and so you can cut it open and get the seeds out quite easily there. Um, and while we're here, I'll show you something that's quite a common problem a lot of people ask questions about, is blossom end rot. 
So a lot of people ask, why is my zucchini going bad? So what's happening? There's different causes for blossom end rot. Um, one's a lack of calcium. Another one is a lack of water, so you're not getting the calcium into the plant. And the other one is uh, poor fertilization. So what's happening is, if you can come here, and this is the female flower. So you'll see the female flower has a little root on it, a fruit on it already. So lots of little female flowers here. And this has been growing since, say about March. And now we've got here a male flower. These male flowers have only come up in the last two weeks. So these fruits up here have not been fertilized. So they need to be harvested and eaten straight away. Because what I've found is if you harvest them, for instance, this one, which is still looking nice, if I left that on the bench, it would still go bad at the end. So fertilization in this case is the problem. So um, keep an eye out for that. So very much um, the difference in the flower structures too. So here's another little male one popping up here. So hopefully from now on, I'll have better fertilization and get bigger fruits. So over here, I like to have lots of flowers in my garden and I grow all my plants all mixed in together. I've, I have hardly any straight rows. Um, so we call that polyculture when you mix up all your vegetables together um, and flowers. So I've got alyssum growing. I've got lots of uh, violas growing. I have lots of camellias around the place and roses and lots of cosmos which the bees all love and a lot of the flowers that I have grown to are edible as well so that's a great bonus too. So this is one of my favorites over here of course, eggplants. So I've got these eggplants, these were planted last year and during the drought they really didn't grow they were just little seedlings mm -hmm. and then again the rain came and they just took off so they're doing really well and I've got some I think they're sugar snap peas I'm growing with them and then I've got some lettuce seeds that I just sprinkled under there and on the other side I've got tomatoes some spinach some more violas and some beetroot and some kale and I've also got stocks and primulas growing in there so the, beautiful these are, Jenny. Yes, they're tatsoi, so they're yeah. ready to harvest now too. Yeah. So a lot of these things, you know, pick and come again. So you can just pick a leaf and um, come back and get some more the next night. The broccolis in the centre, apparently the leaves are actually more nutritious than the actual flowers. The actual, what do you call it, a head? A yep. head. So I've got lots of comfrey around the garden. And this comfrey's flowering at the moment. Now, what's your advice on comfrey? Because I know in our, I put up a couple of questions about it, but also a few other people have as well, um, who haven't been very successful with it. So, what's your advice uh, around I actually successful find comfrey? Comfrey likes a reasonable amount of water because I've tried growing it up in the orchard where it doesn't get much water at all and it doesn't grow. And I also find comfrey's quite in my soil where it's so shallow. Comfrey's supposed to have a deep taproot, but because my soil is so shallow, it, it just doesn't. Um, so I find it's actually one of the first things to wilt. If the comfrey's wilting in the garden, I know I need to water. Okay. So um, decent soil, deep enough soil and water. But you also want to be careful that it doesn't spread everywhere. So I started off with one comfrey plant and now I have lots. Okay. And they're great in the right place. They're a bit of a nuisance if they're growing up in amongst your veggies when you don't want them there. Okay. okay. Now here is a patch that you might think is looking very sad, but this is actually the turmeric bed. So the turmeric is a technically a perennial vegetable and it grows planted around September, October and it grows. It's a beautiful lush green plant. It has beautiful flowers. And then this time of year, autumn it starts dying back um, and you need to 
Well, you can harvest it now as it's starting to die back, or you can wait and leave it right until August or so. Because if you don't, if you don't harvest, it'll then all start sprouting back again. So here's one I prepared earlier to show you. I found that um, this area again had very poor soil, and I didn't really do much to it. But when I started planting the turmeric. I mean, look how lovely and dark yeah. that is. It's really improved the soil. So even if you don't really want to eat the turmeric, it helps improve the soil. And this is lovely and moist, and I haven't planted it at all, uh, watered it. And it's actually, for me, this is really exciting, <laughs> getting my hand this deep in the soil. So you can see, um, you know, that's, that's terrific. Before, I wouldn't have been able to get, you know, past that much. So I'm pretty excited about that. And the turmeric... So you just clean them up a bit. Usually it's good just to grab a hose and give them a... Um, or I leave them actually out to dry and let the soil dry. And then you get... This is the yellow turmeric, but it's beautiful. I mean, have a smell. Mm. It's absolutely gorgeous. Oh, that smells lovely. It's quite strong, so it's, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's beautiful. And so what you can do, just keep them, these in a bowl in your kitchen, September, they'll start, they'll start sending out shoots, mm -hmm. just pop them in the ground. But when you, these turmerics here, I didn't actually plant any of them. So when you're harvesting, sometimes it's hard to get all the bits, so whatever you leave behind will shoot. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. I noticed this, Jenny, you've got an avocado tree in a pot. What's that about? That's right. Well, because of our poor soil and it's still quite shallow, uh, I've tried a few avocados in different places around the garden and they've yeah. all died because okay. they don't like wet feet. Um, so I actually had a go at one in a pot. So this pot's about 50 to 60 centimetres deep and about mm, 30 to 40 across. And it's actually done really well. Touch wood. It's about six years old. And the only avocado in my garden, and I have been getting fruit from it. I didn't get any this year uh, because we got this wind at the wrong time. It blew all the flowers off. So I am thinking um, that I might try another one in a pot um, because, yeah, the others just aren't, haven't succeeded in the soil. And that's it, a dwarf one, is it? It is a dwarf one. Yeah. Um, and it does take a little bit more maintenance because it's in a pot and terracotta, so you need to make sure it's watered well in summertime. Mm -hmm. So, but still in summer, I might water it every, probably every day in the worst of the heat. At the moment, I'm only watering it probably about once a week. And, and what type is it? Can you remember? Oh, there's a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> I still got, I still got the label here. It's a, uh, what's to say? A has. A has. There we go. Okay. Thank you. So um, I've actually got 11 trees in this space. So this part of the garden from the path sort of up to here is about 100 square metres. So I've got the avocado, a pawpaw, there's an orange tree there, the curry leaf over by the house, two mulberries in pots. Uh, then I've got the tamarillo tree. I've got a bay tree hiding over behind the galangal. A uh, lemon tree, which is hugely prolific that's done so well that lemon tree and a bay tree here um, so if you wanted to i also have what i call my pretties in the garden so i have lots of camellias and roses and a couple of magnolias if you wanted to if you only have a small backyard you could get heaps into 100 square meters so if i took those plants out i could have probably 20 fruit trees in here easily and still have veggie bed in the center mm -hmm. so yeah. Can, uh, I, can I ask you a question about your pawpaw? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering. So I've got very tall pawpaws. Right. And, you know, I've had to borrow a, a pool oh, yes. a pool basket from friends to get my pawpaws out. Yep. Do you chop these? And, yes. You can see and, actually... and how, how high do you do them? Um, well, this one, when I chopped it, it was looking really sad. So I chopped it back and it's just come good. And this is as tall as it's gotten so far. Okay. So I haven't had a super tall pawpaw tree problem. Yeah. Again, I did have a beautiful pawpaw tree on the other side, absolutely laden with fruit. 
and then we had some ex-tropical cyclone come through and again in the salad shell the whole thing fell over okay and we had a lot of green papaya salad <laughs> <laughs> can you show me where you chopped it i missed that it's just I'm... down here I, I, if you can see where it's yeah, bulging the... so i cut it right back so quite, i was pretty it's fierce quite with really it low, yeah, yeah. Okay. i didn't think it was going to survive because i've seen people chop them yeah know, this level before but that's and yeah. that's fruiting really well yeah it is it's looking pretty happy at the moment and I've given it a nice deep mulch. I've got some nasturtiums there that which will spread and help keep it um, safe from bugs and things. So at the moment, these beds are still waiting to be, uh, what do you call, planted up. So I've got these beds ready. I'm staggering my plantings by a week or two so I don't have a glut of every, anything. So here I'll be planting these up in the next few weeks. And over here, under the tarp, looking very ugly at the moment, but this was a compost and we've got a tarp and I've got some seed potatoes last week. So this on the weekend will become our potato bed. Okay. So um, I'm a little bit scared to lift it up on my own because I'm sure there's a snake living in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, perennial basil. And the bees, as you can see, absolutely love it. And I found during the drought, this lasted really well. And it was one of the few things flowering. So it pretty much kept the bees alive all through the drought. And you plant it and it just flowers forever. I haven't pruned it or anything. I just cut some off the end. Um, I will give it a bit of a haircut later on. But the bees love it. So here we are again at sort of starting point. Um, so this is my other side of the garden that I like to have more perennials on. Initially this was all veggies as well, but I found again because of the heat. And we've got the bedrooms here. So I've planted more trees in here to make it a bit more of a food forest. And I've got a lovely trellis here too to take away the heat. So I've um, used wood chip in the garden as paths as well so i don't have any lawn out in the front yard at all it's all garden of some kind my lovely roses so i've got a lovely uh, kaffir lime tree up here this is a coffee tree which i find the coffee trees are really pretty um there's some beans down here just starting <coughs> and they'll go red but i do find they're um quite a high water maintenance plant so this one if we get another drought um, it's going to be one of the sacrificial ones because they're quite easy to grow so if it dies it's easy to replace I love this too Jenny but the road's just there but you, you can't I know see it. it was great when I um was building the garden everyone used to stop and say hello and now I can be in the garden no one knows I'm here <laughs> so I have to like jump up and say hello to people um, this is our Panama berry, and I had lots of fruit on it last week, but you um, can still see a couple. So this is a lovely little tree. The fruit is delicious. Um, it tastes like a caramel lolly. It's so good. This will get a bit of a prune in the winter, and hopefully it'll bush right back up. Again, I've got some more turmeric in here. Oh, there's a ginger down there somewhere too. Have it? Oh, no, that's only that one. Here's one. There it is. Would you like to try that one, Suzanne? Oh, you should try it. It's good. Yeah. They're quite good too. They don't have to be super red Thank to you. be yummy. I found too because if you want to get them before the birds, you get them before they're a dark red and they're just as nice as if they're red red. What do you think? Oh, yum. Yeah. Wow. They're that's, nice. That's I was not expecting that. No, no, I wasn't expecting it at all. That's lovely. It's really nice. And it's, I love fruit. I love food that you can just come and pick and put straight in your mouth. You don't have to eat it and you don't have to cook it. Yeah, mm. no, I often find so this berries is, a bit tart, but that's no, beautiful. This one's great. Yeah, Again, okay. depending on how much water it's had, the berries are bigger and fatter. And sometimes they can be a bit, the skin's a bit tough. It's not had a lot of water. 
Um, so in here too, I try and put lots of herbs. I really like salvias in the garden. Um, they're great for providing flowers most of the year. This is a lovely tall pink one. I've got some Mexican sages in here. Um, I call that mother of herbs, but I think it's also a Chinese five spice. I also plant a lot of aloe veras in my garden because of their great um, skin and you can eat them, but also they actually help accumulate carbon in the soil. So they're great uh, carbon builder and they're also great in your compost. So you can never have too many aloe veras. Um, this is a new mandarin that's gone in and a magnolia that got too big for its pot. And uh, this is another trita avocado. So it's only a little, it's only a few months been in here and mm -hmm. it's raised, you can see, I don't yeah. know if you can see how much I've raised it there. So it survived the wet February, but the disadvantage of having it raised was it dried out really fast in that dry weather. So I was watering that twice a day, even with lots of mulch on it. See, I put the hessian on there yeah, too. Yeah, I can see it, yeah. Um, and then this is our lovely acerola tree. It gets beautiful um, cherries around Christmas time. I call it a Christmas tree because you get your beautiful green and red berries. So it looks very Christmassy and very high in vitamin C, very good for you. A little bit tart, um, but quite a nice different kind of a taste and this this tree again is great for providing shade and privacy to the house and I cut it right back last July like right back right back and the February rain it's just gone boof just completely regrown again I'm using wood chip I put uh, sugar cane on the beds for protection here I'm trying to propagate some Perennial spinach, whose name escapes me at the moment. And I've transplanted some little nasturtiums as well. So we'll see how they go. I've got lots of um, sweet potato in here. This is actually a white variety. So it's providing <coughs> mostly habitat and shelter for the soil at the moment. I don't actually like the sweet potato, so I'm going to try and change it out with a nice red one. So, so I, uh, I got a cutting of this. A Did you get of, one of this a, one? Uh, the white one, a couple of years Is ago. Is yours nice? And it was prolific, amazing in the garden. Yeah. And, and we, yeah, we want some more. I do. <laughs> okay. Can I get another one? You cutting? can have some because at the moment I'm feeding it to the chickens and oh, the no, alpacas. That would, that would be great. No, we all love it. Okay. And it's great baked. And um, we, I don't think I've ever grown sweet potatoes as good as that Oh, bat, really? That batch. Oh, okay. Yeah. You sure it was this one? <laughs> yeah. Because I had a few at the time. Oh, I don't know. Well, I'd, it was the, the white one with... Um, you're talking about the white flesh? Yes. Yeah, and the purple on the outside or white on no, the outside? No, this one was white all through. Oh, okay. So I got one with white flesh and purple on the uh, outside and a white one. But they both worked, but the purple one was spectacular. Okay, well, I don't have any of them left. They got... Oh, no. They're gone. <laughs> they're gone. Sorry. <laughs> Might have gone too. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I can everyone, give you one of the yucky the ones. <laughs> be on the lookout, everyone, for some purple sweet potatoes with white flesh, please. <laughs> Okay, so moving right along, I will show you the last of my pumpkin harvest. So these were completely volunteer pumpkins that um, started popping up around December, January, I think. Um, so at the beginning, well, still in the drought before all the rain. And what happened was when it rained all of February, I didn't get into the garden much because it was too wet. And these obviously just took over. And I've got about 50 kilos worth of pumpkins have come up that I've harvested, which I think is pretty good when you haven't done any work for it. But this is the last one. And I think this is probably about four to five kilos. But I wanted to show you this because if you love pumpkins, but think you need a lot of room, they actually really love climbing. They will climb. So this came up on its own. I didn't do anything for it. Yeah. And if you have a look at this tree, you can see the remnants here of another pumpkin. And off this vine, I had a five kilo pumpkin just suspended. And um, it looked fantastic because it was like this spaceship hanging from the tree. We had this conversation at Shahana's a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um, that uh, these volunteer plants seem to do better than if we try and plant them ourselves. Exactly, they yeah. do, yeah. which makes them even better. Like this abicia as well, no, beetle leaf. 
I'm finding that's again coming up on its own quite nicely all over the place. We need to eat that more. Yeah. And here I've got my chocos. We actually really like chocos. I don't know why other people don't like them. Um, this one I've left to get nice and big so it can be a seed um, choco. But if you harvest them when they're smaller, they're lovely and sweet and delicate. Their skin is nice and um, soft. And they're great because generally the zucchini stop growing at this time of year. And your chocos are a great replacement for zucchini. So you can steam them or put them in casseroles and stir fries and stuff. And they're really good at absorbing the flavour. So you put them in a curry and they're just this explosions of your curry flavour. So I love them. Chocos are great. This vine's actually about three years old. And um, it actually was a bit of a struggler to start with. And again, after this rain, it decided it wanted to take off. So I've left it because um, I was going to take this trellis down to allow more room for the trees. But I've given it another shot. So hopefully we'll get more out of it. Jenny, is that uh, is this a Brazilian spinach? Yes, it is. So I found Brazilian spinach too. It's a nice little perennial spinach. Want to try? Yeah. Actually, you should probably pick your own with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> but it's again a nice little spinach that you can have all year round. Um, cooks sort of the same you would with a spinach, so just a light stir fry or a steam. And what I find really great about these um, perennial spinaches is that if you don't like them very much you just mix a bunch of them together and add a bit of lemon juice and cheese and pine nuts and you just make a pesto out of them yeah. and then they're a great sauce and everyone can enjoy them same with like um you can eat lots of the leaves off chocos and the trendles when they're nice and juicy and the same with the pumpkins you can eat the pumpkin leaves as well so all those things you can gather together and just mix up to make a lovely blend to go on your potatoes or your steak and you're getting all those lovely greens mm. it's lovely and it's not too salty no so this one too this is the abicia tree which we saw over there now this i found that i have to tie these up because they fall over but the good thing about these is excuse me they sprout really easily so what i'm going to do is just chop it off and then cut these into sections put them in a, either straight in the ground or in a bit of water until they get roots and then I've got all these extra plants and I will stake them yeah yeah I'll stake them so I think I'll put them all up in the orchard okay and maybe even around the fence here I, I uh, have a question for you I'm sure. wondering what something is down here what's the wait for the camera to come around but what's the, what's this one this one this is another beautiful perennial spinach this is called just Suriname spinach. <laughs> Sorry, I had a brain freeze. Suriname. Now try this one. This is actually a lovely, delicate, got a really lovely, delicate flavour. Mmm. Yeah, it's really nice. So, and again, this actually grows very, you know, prolifically. It's a great um, volunteer plant. I find it all over the place. It's quite fleshy, and it's, it's, it's um, you eat it, and then all of a sudden it has a. Um... Uh, like an okra type, you know, how do you describe that, you know, that, uh, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> that jelly type of, uh, uh mucilaginous. Oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's the word. Yeah, it's got anyway. that kind of, uh, after, it's, it's an, almost an aftertaste of it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I haven't noticed that. But it is another great drought tolerant plant because it's nice and fleshy, I guess it's storing lots of water. Yeah, yeah. And this is another bed where I've got eggplants and peas and I've got the perennial spinach and then I've got the asparagus, a very sad grapevine that hasn't really ever made it. Some warrigal greens over there. Um, rocket and these tomatoes, these were volunteers in another part of the garden, so I transplanted them and I did the, the method where you take off the bottom leaves and, and plant them quite deeply. And that's really working nicely. And chives. Chives is a plant that I put, I find corners of garden beds often get missed out. So I put chives or aloe vera in them. Yeah. And chives are found as another winner for dry weather. So they just keep going. So excellent. And of course the voluntary chili bush. This one's very hot, so we don't actually eat it, but it's so beautiful. And um, I give it away to people all the time because the people who like really hot stuff 
And I've also got some dried in the cupboard in case I need it for some pest control. Mm. So that came up by itself, did it? Yes. Yeah. You can have some if you want. But it's very pretty. It's a very spectacular plant. Yeah. Yeah, it's spectacular. So I thought I might actually show you, because a lot of people ask about planting chocos. So I thought I'd show you how to plant yes, a choco. Yes, So back this way. I'd like to know this because Morag uh, Gamble gave me a choker ah. last time I visited and I planted it and it didn't survive. Okay, did you let it sprout first? Yeah, it had a little sprout. On okay. It, but it just, uh, so I'd love, I'd love to hear it, but okay. I hope Morag's not watching. Sorry, Morag. <laughs> so I let them get quite big until they're practically falling off themselves. And this literally has been sitting on the bench for four days and that's the sprout it's got on it. Yeah. So it's, it wants to grow. They do like a nice big trellis. And like I said, they like quite a bit of water. So this one I'm going to plant in the annual veggie bed so it gets the same amount of water as the annuals. And we'll see how we go. So it's really easy. Oh, look at that beautiful worm. So that brings great joy to me that I've got lovely big worms in my garden showing that I've got good soil. So it might not be very deep, but what I've got is pretty good. A wormy. So I just sort of make a little bit of a well and then just pop it on there. And then I'm just gonna cover it up. Done. <laughs> so I hope it grows. <laughs> well, that was easy. Yeah. That's not what I did. Okay. <laughs> I, I covered it up completely. Right. Yeah, and I think it it, uh, it it was just it just looked like it had too much moisture. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it goes. Okay. Okay. So over here, Chrissy, I've got one of my ponds. I've got two ponds in the garden. So I have ponds. So I'm increasing my um, pest management crew. Yeah. So ponds are really great eh, for your bees to have water, but also your dragonflies and damselflies. Um, and other small animals. I put the bricks in this so birds can drink out of it. And in here I've just got some native fish, the little rainbow fish. So they will eat the mosquito larvae. Hopefully, I don't know if you can see any. And I'm very excited actually because they have actually been breeding. Oh, this one. Can you see it? No. I don't know if you can see it. So, so ponds are great to have in your garden. Great way to recycle the bathtub. Um, and also with ponds, plants in water actually grow really quickly. So it's a great way of um, creating, you can like just clear this out and add that to your compost. Um, azola is a great plant to have. I don't have it at the moment, but it's a nitrogen fixer. So it can cover your surface and you just scoop it out and put it into your compost or give it to your chickens. Okay. So, and here also is one of my friends in the garden. This is my little garden caddy. It's great. So this is, I can just take this around the garden. It's got all my tools in it. It's actually, I think it's a carpenter's caddy. Yeah, it's okay. called. Yeah, so it's just from Bunnings. And um, I actually tend to put too much stuff in it, so it's a bit heavy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really handy, so I can just have everything I need. This is a good one. You can just pick this one up at Bunnings and again I planted that once and this has been in the garden coming back each year now for like eight years so and it's also self-seeded around the place um, and then I've got you know I'm planting these perennial basils wherever I can at the moment and again I've got some primulas and here this is actually I wanted to show you um, this is a Mexican sage so again it's another salvia and it gets lovely and big and bushy has lovely big purple spikes of flowers for the insects. Not looking its best at the moment. So what happens is a lot of them tend to die back as the weather gets cooler. But as you can see, they're all coming back at the bottom. So what you do is you just chop them back and give them a bit of a haircut. And then, so you do that all over and just add these to the compost. And if you want to propagate them, um, a 
before they start buying, dying back, you can just cut some off or get the shovel and you can see they're starting to clump. So mm. just dig yourself out a clump. One of the ones we saw over there was actually a clump. Okay. So propagator, so pretty easy. Yeah. And then I've got some little cute stuff in the garden as well. Little owl. <laughs> And on this side, actually, I've got some lovely tarragon, Mexican tarragon. And if you have, it's quite a floppy plant, but have a smell. Tell me what it smells like. Is it uh, licorice? Yeah, it's really mm. strong, licorice smell. It's quite, yeah, it's quite lovely. It's strong. Yeah, the, the leaves, yeah, that's it, when it's nice, before it flowers, when you eat it, it's really lovely. <laughs> Sorry. It's really yummy yeah i probably wouldn't eat it now it's looking a bit um and the seeds are really easy to collect i didn't hope i didn't want to miss these ones actually so you just grab your little seed heads there we go so just grab yourself a little envelope and just take all the the brown ones off and then you've got some for next season same with the cosmos these are really well, most of these have come off. But you can see their seeds that are quite lovely and structural, very architectural, very pretty. Again, just pull off their heads and you've got their seeds ready for harvesting. So just, there you go. Do you do much seed saving? I do. Yeah. I do quite a bit. Yeah. So I, I've got quite a collection. Okay. Any advice for people doing seed saving? Um, keep them dry, keep them in the dark, label them label yeah. them well so I put what it is and when I harvested it um, try and get the best one from your best plant like for instance I'll be keeping the seeds from my biggest pumpkin mm -hmm. if it tastes nice yeah um, and like the trombochino so look for the best fruit so and if you want to um, extend your growing seasons maybe if you're collecting tomatoes grab some seeds from the tomatoes that early and early yeah. and then some from the last and then the best as well and maybe label them yeah so you know what you're getting great and so my lovely roses too and um petunias so lots more flowers through the garden and now we'll head up to the orchard oh, orchard yeah. yep another zucchini our pumpkin so uh can't stop them once they keep going look so how long have you been here jenny We've been here for nearly 10 years now. And you can see um, in the name of soil improvement too along here, I don't mow my lawn as often as the neighbours. Yeah. So I'm actually trying to let the roots of my grass grow deeper and help that improve the soil. So I only sort of cut the lawn when it needs uh, getting rid of weed heads. So. doesn't look super impressive at the moment so this is our the orchard slash food forest now the trees along the fence line we actually planted them probably about six months after we got here so they're probably about eight to nine years old um, and again that was before I knew too much about soil so we were digging into the deco and basically planting them into the deco which is like so when it rains, the deco, it fills up and they drown. Mm -hmm. So I lost a couple of trees, but the olive survived and the um, lime and the mango have all survived. The mulberry is only a few years old and this is a um, elderflower. And this poor little guy, it's a garam chala. Oh, okay. And um, it's hardly grown at all. So. It's, uh, it's really struggling. So how old is that one? Oh, that's years old. Yeah. Uh, five, six years at least. Yeah. And um, it's actually a little bit taller than it was. So again, up here we didn't have any soil. So what I've done is wood chips have been my friend. And I can put my towel. So um, I'll see if I can... Again, this is just nothing. I've used lots again salvias. But if you have a look, 
So down here now, under the wood chip, it's actually soil. Yeah. So we can dig we, we can dig a hole deep enough to bury a chicken now up here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a, that's a good metaphor. That's a, that's a good measure. We can bury a chicken. It's all right. Um, so what I did was we had these trees planted first and then the rest was just weeds. It wasn't even grass. Um, and I got really lucky and scored a free load of wood chips. So it was about 20 cubic metres of wood chips. And I basically spread them out about 30 centimetres deep. Um, and I put on some, I think I had some sheep poo and alpaca poo. I had some spoiled loosen that went on top and then I put some sugar cane on top and then I just threw out some bird seed, um, which was my green manure. So this is basically this. So it grew, grew corn and sunflowers and oats and I think this is sorghum or millet. And these are great too because these just keep coming up and they're always, let's see, improving the soil. There we go. So you can see that so it's hanging the roots are actually hanging onto the soil so it means I've got a good microbial life going on in there so lots of fungi and my um, bacteria and stuff so it took quite a while and it seems like a long time but when you're busy in the rest of the garden after two years I actually had soil yeah and again I, I didn't water it because it was just too much so I was relying on the rain um, and I just come and give it some more green manure, do it a cut and drop. Again, we had volunteer pumpkins came and smothered it, um, provided a lot of biomass. And um, once the weeds started coming up on their own, I knew it was okay to start planting into. So I've got, um, again, more salvias, tanners, lots of tanners. These are another winner in the drought i found these really went well through the drought yeah. and these are great chop and drop plant you just chop them put them down they grow really easily and you can eat them um, as you can see we started clearing we just put the weeds down here and then we'll start moving the wood chip back along here so kitchen peas are another beauty So I've got a few pigeon peas and these are volunteers. So these are lovely. So these actually fix nitrogen in your soil. Um, the flowers, your typical pea sort of flower, they're very pretty. They get lots of insects come in for them. And I don't have any pods at the moment, but they grow a nice pod about that big. And you can eat them when they're green as a bit of a stir fry vegetable, or you can let them go brown and then you can cook them like a dull. So they're like dried peas inside. And I find the um, king parrots love them as okay. well. They'll come in and eat the pods. Yeah. And again, you can cut these back, just do a chop and drop, and they'll just push back up again. So they're another great thing to have in the garden. And I've got, again, lots of bay trees, lots of rosemary, citrus, lemongrass, moringa over there. So, um, so this is still very much in development and on the weeds and stuff haven't you don't get upset about weeds because they're doing a job in the garden so they're covering your soil from the sun stopping it from drying out and they're feeding your microbes your bacteria and your fungi so they're all doing work for you so you just come along chop them off and put them down and then put what you want over the top a um, bit of wandering dew over there, which is actually edible as well. The alpacas love eating that, and so do the chickens. I just want to thank you for showing us around today. And You're welcome. I, I'm just such a fountain of knowledge, and uh, I know there's a lot of people in in uh, Sanford when they have a question, they they ask Jenny. So um, just really glad that you could come and be part of the trail. Thank you. And uh, and. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing this grow over time. Yes. And uh, just thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And I just want to add that gardening is so much fun because there's always something to learn and there's always something going on and it doesn't always look beautiful, but you know, there's always something to look forward to and discover and 
and I love sharing what I know with friends and things. So thanks for over having choc me. Over chocolate cake. Uh, chocolate cake especially. <laughs> <laughs> okay.